Hi everyone, my name is Miss Wright, and today I'm going to teach you about manners in medieval Europe. Today's agenda, do you know in attendance, five minutes, choice activity, writing notes or drawing a detailed diagram, 10 minutes, video activity, 10 minutes, group activity, 15 minutes, and share out, exit ticket, five minutes. For the do now activity, I'm going to have my students create their own definition of the word manner using the graphic organizer provided. Since I teach special education, I am differentiating the type of graphic organizer I'm using for students that are higher functioning uh, in contrasting with students that are lower functioning. When students finish the do now activity, I will engage them in a class discussion about the current term manner and the types of manners found in the Middle Ages. They will be comparing and contrasting and giving examples. Since many of my students are visual learners, I try to use as many photos as I can in my lessons. For this lesson, I am showing them a picture of a manner of today, maybe something you would find in the English countryside, with a manner of the past, a picture of something you would probably find in medieval Europe. I will ask them to compare and contrast the two pictures, and if they need to, they can use a Venn diagram graphic organizer because I teach special education, I feel that it is very necessary to give my students a choice of the activities they can complete in class. Students must complete at least one of the options I provide, however if they want to they can complete both. The first option is for students to copy the following definitions and notes into their notebooks, and the second option is for students to draw a diagram of a medieval manner into their notebooks from the notes presented on the smart board. These are the notes. Important things to remember about the manor system during the Middle Ages. Manor systems were used throughout Europe, mostly England, France, and what we now call Germany, between the 5th and 15th centuries. The manor system, unlike today, was not a home for the wealthy. Instead, it was a compound, kind of like a military base, where people of all socioeconomic backgrounds lived together. What does socioeconomic mean? Socioeconomic is a combination of social and economic factors which determine a person's place in society. On a manor, there were lords and ladies, lesser lords and ladies, knights and serfs. While the lords and ladies lived lives of luxury, the serfs had very difficult lives. Over 90% of the population were made up of serfs. Why live on a manor? After the fall of the Roman Empire, the different nations and states throughout Europe had little money and little protection. Kings could no longer protect their people from barbarians who would loot and destroy towns. Thus, kings broke their lands up into fiefs which they would give to lords for their loyalty. Lords would rule their fiefs or land and build manors on the land for them and their people to live. The deal of land for loyalty between the king and the lord is called feudalism. Living on a manor provided people with protection from the barbarians and other potential dangers. Manors were very much self-sufficient, meaning that they didn't need to go outside the manor walls for anything they needed. They grew their own food, raised their own animals, had a town blacksmith, a town baker, and probably even a town candlestick maker. Manor life. Each manor had a church. Remember that most Europeans at this time were Catholic. A manor house where the lords and ladies lived, small huts where the peasants and serfs lived, and many, many fields for farming. Each manor had knights who protected the manor and prepared for battle. Each manor had a stone wall protecting the inner manor from danger. It's important to remember that many people, especially the wealthy back then, did not live the way we assume the wealthy would live today. They lived in very overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. Okay, so we all know that Miss Wright is absolutely not uh, Picasso, she's definitely not Michelangelo, and she has no artistic talent at all. But let's pretend for a minute that we understand what this looks like. Let's pretend that this square is the shape of England and that that circle that we see right in the middle that's where the King of England lives. Now because the fall of the Roman Empire occurred that King of England cannot protect the rest of his country. He could only really protect where he lives but what about all this other area here? Well what he does is he breaks the country up into a lot of different little pieces and in those little pieces let's say all those little pieces that I just drew right now, he gives them away to his friends, his friends that are lords, that are loyal to him, and that will do anything to make the king happy. Now, these fiefs or these pieces of land that the king broke up and gave to the lords, well, guess what? They still need protection. So within each piece of land is its own little circle. And that little circle that I'm drawing right now represents a manor. So the king lives in the big circle right here, 
and he has enough knights to protect him. But what about the rest of the country? He can't protect the rest of the country. The fall of the Roman Empire occurred, and there is no longer a strong Holy Roman Empire. There is no longer a strong Holy Roman Empire army. Okay? So the king breaks the country up into lots of little pieces. He gives each of these pieces to one of his friends, or to a few of his friends, the lords. And the lords now are very worried. They say, how are we going to protect the land? If the king can't protect the land, how will we be able to do it? So what they do is they create manors. And these manors are small little towns within that fief, within that piece of land that the king gave them. And that manner is self-sufficient. It's the manners that we've been looking at in the notes and that we will continue to look at in the video in a few minutes. These manners will have, its own, have their own church. They will have their own manor house. They will have their own fields for farming. They will have their own blacksmith. They will have every, every single part of the social ladder as well. So you will have the lords and the ladies. You will have the lesser lords and ladies. You will have the knights. You will have the peasants or the serfs, just like you would have anywhere else in the country. And this social ladder we discussed yesterday, so you should have a very good idea of how each person within each part of the social ladder acts and behaves and what is expected of them. So within the manor, you're going to have a lord and lady who lives relatively a life of luxury for the time. You're going to have knights that protect the manor from other people in other countries or from other manors that might come over and want to steal stuff from them. And you're going to have the peasants that work those really long, long days and are very religious because if they're not religious and they don't believe that after their life is over that uh, they will live forever in a happy, happy existence in heaven, then they have no justification for that hard, hard, difficult life that they're living now. Remember, it's called the Dark Ages, not because the sun didn't shine during that time, but because life was very, very difficult for 90% of the population, or for all those serfs that we've been talking about. So I hope that my beautiful drawing better explains for you or better shows you exactly what was taking place in the Middle Ages and how kings and lords and ladies had to work very hard to protect the land from barbarians and from other people who might want to come steal things from them. For video activities, I try to accommodate my visual learners in a more active participation throughout the lesson. At this time, I usually show Brain Pops and have the students complete graphic organizers, but because Brain Pop is copyrighted, I couldn't use it for this website. are forced to tour the inn yards of England, while well, Mr. Burbage and the Chamberlain's men are invited to court and receive ten pounds to play your piece, written for my theatre, by my right, at my risk, when you were green and great. What well, piece? Which you group back? No, it's comedy they want, Will. Comedy, like Romeo and Ethel. <laughs> Who wrote that? Nobody. You were writing a premiere. I gave you three pound a month since. Half what you owe me. I'm still due for one gentleman of Verona. Will, what is money to you and me? I, your patron, you, my word right. When the plague lifts, Burbage will have a new play by Christopher Marlowe for a curtain. I will have nothing for the road. Mr. Hensler, will you lend me 50 pounds? 50 pounds? What for? Burbage offers me a partnership in the Chamberlain's Men for 50 pounds. My days as a hired player are over. Oh, cut out my heart. Throw my liver to the dogs. No, then. Now, I don't usually show my classes clips of Shakespeare in Love. Uh, I usually show brain pops because they review strong vocabulary, uh, because they review and differentiate instruction in a way that I find is effective and that I see the success and I see um, my students understanding the material in a much more um, deep and productive way. Now, because I can't show Brain Pop <laughs> on uh, my own website or in my own videos because it is copyrighted, um, I did show Shakespeare in Love for this lesson. And even though 
I usually use Brain Pop and with Brain Pop, uh, graphic organizers and worksheets and things like that. I just showed this one and a half, two minute clip of Shakespeare in Love and wanted my students to get a better understanding of how people acted, how people dressed, how people spoke, and what the setting looked like. My students live in a very urban environment in New York City. They don't have a very good idea of what rural living is like or what life outside of New York City is all about. So it's very hard for them to picture dirt roads. It's very hard for them to picture open fields and lots of forests. It's very difficult for them to imagine what life in the Middle Ages is like. So in showing this clip from Shakespeare in Love, I wanted to reiterate and to remind my students that just because they live in a particular time in a particular place doesn't mean that all people live in that particular time in that particular place. I wanted them to continue to build their vocabulary. I wanted them to continue to build their own prior knowledge of the material and of what life back then was actually very much like. In the video um, of Shakespeare in Love, we aren't actually able to see exactly what I wanted the students to see because it isn't the brain pop I had planned on showing. In the brain pop, um, Moby and Tim, the characters that we see in those short educational clips, uh, very much reiterate and very much redefine for the students exactly what the manner itself looks like. So although I showed my students this very pathetic drawing a few minutes ago of this being England and each part being a thief and that, oh, oh sorry, that over there being the king and that the king couldn't protect all the land, I just want to show another equally horrendous drawing just to kind of um, show what I had hoped to show via the brain pop that would, but what I wasn't able to. So I drew this. This is a circle just like the circles we see in this drawing. And this circle represents the manor. The manor which is the small town within the fief. And the fief is that big piece of land. So the whole land isn't taken up by the lords and the ladies. They actually built their own manor, their own small town within the land that the king gave them. And this is what the manor would stereotypically look like. You would have a big circular town with a fence or big stone wall on the exterior protecting it from the outside world. You would have, sorry, right here the castle or the manor house. Over here where the peasants or the serfs would live in small huts. Over here the blacksmith shop and the baker shop. And over here, the fields for farming. Now, I had spent some time when I was in college traveling throughout Europe and taking on the world. And I had actually visited an area a very rural Germany, about two hours outside of Frankfurt. And then as I'm driving through these small towns, what I noticed myself is that you would have towns that are still shaped like this. And each town still had its own castle. Now, lords and ladies don't live there anymore, and you don't need knights to protect it. But what I found very interesting is that I would be in one small town. Let's say it's just like that. Sorry, let's use a different piece of paper. One small town that looked just like this. And it would have its own castle and its own bunch of shops and a lot of houses. And then there would be a street just like this. One street uh, going both ways for two different sets of cars. Cool. Uh, and there would be another town right here. Exactly like the previous town. You'd still have a castle and you still have homes and shops. And all of those towns were circular shaped. And they still had the remnants or um, the past evidence of stone walls that had encased the whole little town to protect the town from outsiders. I felt that that was very cool. I felt that I was able to uh, kind of understand on a different level what medieval Europe was like, what it was like to live in one small town within your fief, within your area of land, and then you just drive, or in my case, I like to go jogging, I would jog like 30 minutes outside that town, and I would be in a whole new different town with a different name. But it still had those stone walls surrounding it. It still had one castle of its own. It still had a bunch of houses and a few shops. And I felt that that was very, very cool. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this segment of the lesson. And um, we're going to move on to a new activity right now.